lecture is Dr. Jan Narvesen. Uh, Dr. Narvesen taught philosophy for more than 40 years at the University of Waterloo. He has written hundreds of papers and seven books, best known of which is perhaps the libertarian idea. The most read by students is Moral Matters, and his favorite is You and the State. He has also for 40 years headed the Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber Music Society. Almost all of those whose 40 or concerts per year are held at his home in Waterloo. He likes to write things that people can read, not necessarily what academics write. He has devoted his life for searches of a moral theory. His talks explain the challenges and hopes fully a solution. One that is not new as he insists, but perhaps his way of presenting will be. Doctor, you're nervous. Well, um, Professor Pliner has uh, um, woven on a, a huge tapestry. Uh, by comparison, uh, my tapestry is, is, is about like this. <laughs> but it's still, I think, a pretty important tapestry. It's all, about, it's all about people and their interactions, and that's a pretty important subject. Um, as um, Giant uh, graciously pointed out, I've been teaching ethics for a long time, about um, actually pretty close to 50 years altogether, one way or another. Um, and I want to say a little bit about philosophy before we get into the, the thick of my presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a very peculiar subject because philosophers don't know much. I mean, um, and in a sense, they professionally don't know much. Uh, our arguments are supposed to be um, based on what, what's pretty obvious. Indeed, ideally, your philosopher starts with things that are just utterly obvious to everybody. And from those, he infers premises that are incredibly controversial <laughs> or sound almost crazy. And yet he claims that this follows from that. That's a good trick if you can pull it off. <clears throat> um, but in my case, uh, I think what I try to pull out from my um, premises is not much less obvious than the premises uh, themselves. And I'm sure that most of you people here are pretty well where I want to come out of this. What I hope to show, however, is that you actually have very good reason for being where you are, and that it's not a matter of um, happenstance or take your pick uh, or anything like that. So. Um, next uh, point about philosophy is that we're interested, at least we used to be interested in fundamentals. That is, um, we would like to know the basic why of our subjects. And my subject is um, moral philosophy. And I've always been interested all my entire academic career um, in the question, well, how do we know that this or that is right or wrong? Do we have any really good reason for this? And uh, as I say, I have pretty well come to the conclusion that the answer is yes. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Now, to begin with, the, to begin with the substantive part of my talk then, uh, we need to make a, a very, very important distinction which I think uh, the failure to make of which is devastating to uh, the, the enterprise. And that's a distinction between what I at any rate call ethics on the one hand and what I call morals on the other. Now a lot of people, I mean there's no sort of regular distinction between these two terms, uh, though the way I use them I think is probably closer to um, ordinary usage than any other way of talking about it, which is why I choose them. Ethics is a more general subject. Ethics is the subject of, well, what should I do in life? What's it all about? Um, broadly speaking, then, ethics is the subject of how to live 
and it's a very important subject, obviously, but it's also, in, in a very, in a sense, difficult question. And it's so difficult that it's, it's rather plausible to say that there probably can't be, and almost certainly isn't, any sort of uniform theory about, uh, about how to live. There are a few pointers, uh, and then there's lots and lots of variety. The other subject, morals, is much narrower than ethics because morals is about us in our interactions. It's what ought I to do as a member of society? And that's a question that we can each ask, all of us. There is an important question, who do we mean by us, by all of us? And I will say a fair bit more about that uh, shortly. For the moment, let's just not answer that and just say, well, us means people in general. There's one very important thing about people in general, and that's that they differ. <laughs> they differ a whole lot, not only in groups, but as individuals, as we know. Of course, Western society is notorious for being individualistic, or at least it used to be. Um, and part of the point of this is that uh, the differences uh, uh, between one person, one individual and another, are really uh, quite great. And it's because, one of the, it's because they're so great that we have you know, one of the main problems of, of uh, morals, since after all, morals tries to get us all together into some kind of more or less uniform um, out, output. And the question is, well, how do we manage that? Now, um, philosophers used to emphasize, and still to some that we do emphasize, they certainly argue, and they argue all the time. That's what, argue, that's what philosophy is all about. Um, back when I started studying this subject, which was quite a long time ago now, alas, <laughs> um, there was a, a kind of hobgoblin uh, in the philosophical field. Um, and that's perhaps not an, a fair word for it because it, it's, it's a hobgoblin with a whole lot of, of power to it. And that was called the naturalistic fallacy, wonderful uh, sort of technical, one of the few sort of jargonistic philosophical uh, terms that uh, occupies this, this field uh, um, uh, reasonably. Now the naturalistic fallacy, if it is a fallacy, and of course that's like everything else in philosophy, that's disputed. But um, the idea of the naturalistic fallacy is this. Um, you can't get from a certain category of things called facts uh, more broadly descriptive utterances which are aimed at telling us how things are in the world, ranging from facts to large theories, but they're all about how things are. Now, in ethics and moral philosophy, we're trying to say how things ought to be. We're trying to get at values. And the naturalistic fallacy, if, as I say, there is such a thing, says, well, you cannot derive an evaluative conclusion from a factual premise. Now, everybody <laughs> in philosophy, that's a very strong word, but everybody agrees in some sense or other that um, the, the realm of fact is the realm of science. And we all think we can get somewhere in that. Well, we used to think so anyway. <laughs> but at that stage, in principle, there are methods available for helping us know how things, you know, what, what goes on out there in the world. We can measure and so forth and observe. But how do you go about measuring or observing what's right and wrong is the question. It's not at all um, obvious. So the question is, how do we go about proving things in ethics? Now, instead of talking at that same level of sort of logical generality about that, I'm going to turn to a selection, a very big selection of uh, theories that have been very, very influential in philosophy and I think in ordinary life down through the last you know, couple of thousand years or so. <clears throat> And I'm going to treat these as theories of what I called morals, because that's what we're talking about here. 
The first theory, which is in a way a very kind of natural one, if it's a theory at all, is what I'll call, or what indeed we call, egoism. And I'm sure lots of you uh, have a word like that. Selfish, for example, is a, normally a kind of term of abuse. Saying that somebody is selfish, that's a criticism. It is, but it's a criticism of something that's, after all, terribly natural, which is to be concerned with yourself. Now, egoism is the view that what everybody ought to do is whatever is in that, own, that person's own maximum interest. You could say what's for his own good, but the word good is a little bit misleading in this connection. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's the right idea. So each of us is, is you know, correctly self-concerned and exclusively self-concerned is the idea of egoism. Now the question is, um, well, is egoism the, the name of a, of a human tendency, so to speak? Answer, sort of, yes. It's not a very accurate name because most of us are not the way egoists uh, describe us. That is, hardly any of us are indeed exclusively self-interested. It's very difficult to be exclusively self-interested. On the other hand, we have a sort of narrow circle of uh, other interests. We have um, our families and our friends and our, you know, perhaps our jobs and various kinds of interests, and, but they're all, generally speaking, fairly narrow. And it's not, not too crazy to think that they begin with, you know, the, the concern for this individual person. Now, if we try to make egoism into a moral theory, what's that? Or into a moral uh, doctrine, what's that? Every man for himself or herself, every person for him or herself, as we keep on uh, trying to say nowadays in some non-grammatically awkward way. Um, what happens if you make that into a, a, a moral uh, doctrine? Now, morality... Um, is, roughly speaking, marching orders for society. The idea of morality is it's a, a set of rules or precepts or principles which are to apply to everybody. So we tell everybody, do this or do that. And we tell everybody, in a sense, the same thing. Now, I'm going to talk about relativism in just a moment, so you can table that for a moment. But let's go back to egoism for a minute. So suppose you tell everybody this. You tell them, um, ignore everybody else. Just act on your own interests, no matter what it is, period. Is this something that anybody can, can believe? Well, of course, in a sense, the doctrine is totally, totally insane. I can see how you're concerned with yourself, but when I'm told that everybody ought to be concerned with only himself, and I look out here and look at the other seven billion people in the world, and I think what they can do to me, and what they might well do to me in their, if they're acting exclusively in their own interests, I blanch <laughs> for very good reason. There's something uh, so crazily destructive about the idea that egoism should be a moral rule for everybody that it really doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't hold your attention very long if it weren't that it sounds like it's somehow rooted in something called human nature. But remember that naturalistic fallacy. If it's true, and it's not, as I say, but supposing it is true that everybody is in some sense concerned with himself, it hardly follows that everybody ought to be concerned exclusively with himself, especially when he's dealing with other people, which is what morality is all about. And as soon as you look at it that way, egoism looks like a perfectly crazy, indeed insane theory. Now, next there's something that used to be called cultural relativism. More generally, there's relativism. You could think of egoism as sort of individual relativism, one uh, set of fundamental rules for each of the seven billion people that there are out there. Cultural relativism says, no, it's my tribe, or my culture, more generally speaking, that lays down the rules. And the idea of cultural relativism is that each person is to do what his or her uh, culture uh, tells him to do. So culture is the source of the moral rules on this view. So what about cultural relativism? Is that a good idea? 
Well, again, it has descriptive plausibility. Anthropologists go around the world and they tell us, you know, what this, that, and the other sort of tribe um, uh, believes. And it's, again, natural in some sense or other for people to uh, accept and, and to try to live up to or take as a, a guiding rule for their life um, the rules laid down by their culture. Now, there's just one trouble. I mean, cultural relativism, as I say, is relative. And saying it's relative means that it varies from one culture to another. Each culture has a different sense of rules. Just as for egoism, there's a different set of rules for each individual, which is crazy. So each culture has a different set of rules. And then what happens when they interact? Well, of course, in principle, the general answer is the same as for egoism. There's trouble because uh, the different cultures have different ideas about what's right and wrong. And, uh, well, we know very well from a brief look at human history how difference of cultures can set, each, set people at each other's throats. And that's something that should make some difference to most of us. Um, we could say a little bit, quite a bit more about that, but I don't have a whole lot of time to do that. So I'm just going to say, look, the, the thing about cultural relativism is when, it, when it's a group directing people to treat people who are outside their own culture, then does that mean, look, am I, as a member of culture one, looking at this person in culture two, am I supposed to tell him, well, you're rightly guided by your own culture, even though its rules conflict with the rules of my culture? Or do I say, hey, no, you ought to be doing things my way, which is, of course, the right way, since it's laid down by my culture. Of course, if I say that, I realize, well, he's saying the same thing. And then the logical point comes out. If we take culture as the ultimate authority, what we get is, again, um, chaos, of course. How can it be anything else? Well, now, a kind of reaction to this, in a sense, is the various religious moralities. And I'm going to lump them all together under the heading of religious morality. Although, let's remember that in practical terms, there are a whole lot of different religions. I remember some years ago uh, seeing it claimed that there were something like 2,500 recognized distinct religions in the United States alone, not counting you know, all the other countries in the world. So that, of course, uh, one thing about religious morality is you're sure to get the same chaotic result that you get with egoism or cultural relativism, namely, um, an inability for people of different religions to cope with each other. But uh, there's a more fundamental problem with religion which is extremely, extremely important to recognize. And it, it, today, I think in particular, it's especially important to recognize this, even though it may sound like a kind of highly theoretical point. But practically speaking, um, if we were asked, well, what's sort of the current most prominent um, moral type problem in the world today, you could readily be forgiven for saying it's terrorism. It's, and the kind of terrorism that we have is people uh, blowing people up and while they're doing so, saying something like, well, you know, um, Allahu Akbar or whatever. I mean, if it's, a, it's mostly Muslim religion nowadays that's pretty well carrying the terrorists. It's never been entirely any one uh, religion, nor has it always been religion at all. But what I'm concerned about is the idea that, OK, these people's religious beliefs are what justify them. I mean, they're, they're what they appeal to in justification of what they're doing. And I think that an awful lot of people out there, I mean, there are a lot of religious people today still. And I think that an awful lot of these people think that their religion really is the sort of ultimate authority on ethical and moral truth. And that's the view that I want to come down on very hard in this uh, brief treatment. Now, it's not new with me. I mean, the problem was, was exposed pretty much by Plato 2,500 years ago. 
Uh, the point is, he's still right. <laughs> One of the few, I think, real, genuine accomplishments in, in philosophy has been to show what's wrong with religious morality. And that's, that has an ex extreme practical um, importance, recognizing this fact. So what's wrong with religious morality? Well, religious morality is, there's this um, so-called, supposedly perfect personage up there who lays down the rules. And you wanna know what's right or wrong? It's very simple, just ask God. And he'll tell you. Okay, now there are two different questions. Of course, one question is, well, what will he tell us? And of course, different religions will have him telling you different things. That's one little problem. Um, the same religion will be interpreted by different of its interpreters as telling him different things. That's another little problem. But I wanna raise a more fundamental problem, which is, why should we believe him anyhow? Now, asking this question is really what's novel because religious people don't ask it. If they did, they'd have some difficulty answering it. But if they tried to answer it, almost certainly the answer would be this. Well, we ought to do what God says because God, after all, is good indeed. Not just good, but ta-da, perfect. And how much... You can't do better than that, can you? Well, no, you can't in a sense. The trouble is it's too good, and why? Because consider the word good. Now, when you say that God is good, the question is, what are you saying about him? Is it that God obeys his own rules? Yeah, well, lots of people obey their own rules, folks. <laughs> That's not going to get you anywhere you have to believe that God's rules are the right rules. Okay, great. What makes them the right rules is our question. And now you've got a problem. Are you saying that divine beings can think up just any damn thing and say this is what's right or wrong? You know, um, I think that Pythagoras believed that it was wrong to throw salt over your left shoulder, or did he believe it was right and required of everybody? Anyway, I mean, you can think of any number of goofy things that some supposedly omnipotent dictator could lay down as the rule for all, and would you be persuaded that that was really the right rule for morals by that? I don't think so. On the contrary, whenever you say that God has laid down the rules, what you mean is somebody who knows what the right rules are has laid them down. My question is, well, yeah, but how do you know? And the answer can't be, well, he asks himself. See, you've got to do better than that. There must be a moral theory kicking around back there that God, who is supposed to be a very bright guy, happens to know, and that's why they're the right thing to do. But if they are, maybe we ought to look and try to find out what that theory is. And the point is, whatever it is, it cannot be the theory that whatever God says is right just because he says it. It doesn't make any sense. And that's very important because in even today's world, I would guess that about 97% of all the people in the world today do think something like this. They think that um, you know, what's right and wrong is determined by uh, by God, and they believe in God, and that's the end of the matter. And my point, it's not the end of the matter. As soon as you think about it for, you know, 12 seconds, you realize it can't be the end of the matter. The end of the matter is whatever the right theory is down the way that maybe God, and certainly, hopefully, all of us might be able to get a handle on, but it isn't the religious theory. So the point is that the religious theory is self-exterminating. And that is definitely a vice when it comes to theories, that they should be self-exterminating. All right, moving right along. Um, there is a, a very popular movement among philosophers. It, it was extremely popular. It's still somewhat popular today, which has a, another slightly technical term. They call it intuitionism. Now, in the case of moral philosophy, Intuitionism is the view that there are some fundamental moral truths which cannot be further explained. They're at the bottom of it all, right? If you're an intuitionist, what you think is that somehow the human mind is capable of just seeing these things, you know, recognizing that they are the moral truth. And that's the basis of it all. 
intuitionism has uh, a couple of problems. One of the big problems is this. Mm. If that's the way things are, why do people believe different things? I mean, one of, the, one of the things that gave rise to cultural relativism, one of the things that makes philosophy 100 uh, or 101, moral philosophy, an interesting subject is cultural relativism or any kind of relativism. How is it people vary, seem to vary a whole lot in their moral pronouncements if we all have this wonderful faculty of being able to spot the truth and somehow what we've all spotted is the same truth? And that's, of course, the next problem, which is, why would it be the same truth? I mean, this is sort of the black box theory of ethics, see? I mean, we've each got a little black box in the corner of our mind, and we look in there, and lo and behold, there are the ethical truths. And the trouble is, if you look at it that way, then it's not at all obvious why Jones, when he looks into his black box, should get the same answers as Smith when he looks into his black box. And indeed, they don't come out the same. So why isn't that a problem? And the intuitionist answer is to wave his hand. That's not a very good answer in my view. So uh, I think the idea that intuitionism is the right way to go in ethics is, um, roughly speaking, daft. Now, that's a strong word. And you know I've got many pages and many books of hundreds of pages in length written by very smart people defending this theory. And in my experience, which is fairly limited because I've only been teaching this subject for 50 years, and I don't spend all day long reading, but still, I've read quite a lot, and I have yet to see an intuitionist who has been able to satisfactorily solve the problem I've just been describing. And I think that's not surprising because like with religious ethics, it's a problem that's intrinsic to the whole idea. And that suggests that there's something really wrong going on. All right, well now, kind of related to intuitionism is um, natural law theory. And I may be getting close to home for some of you because many libertarians, I think, think of themselves as um, um, accepting a kind of natural law uh, in the form of libertarianism. So what's natural law? Now, here we've got to make a, another very import, important distinction. Um, philosophy, by the way, has been described as follows. A philosopher is a man who, when he gets into trouble, makes a distinction. Uh, it's a very, very good thing to do. And the distinction I want to make here is between two quite different ideas about natural law. One is that it's a law which is um, informed by and based on things other than the acts of human legislators. All right? So it's natural law as opposed to legal, artificial, governmental type law. Now, if in terms of that distinction, I think we all want to be natural lawyers. We all want to try to find out what it is that makes morals right, what makes it tick. What are the basic facts that make it tick? Those facts, whatever they are, are not going to be the output of some uh, government somewhere. And indeed, I mean, I haven't even put on the list here um, the idea, the surely completely bizarre, mad idea that what's right is determined by the government. I mean, um, how insane can you get? Anyway, natural, but the other sense of natural law then is that uh, as it were, the right laws of morals grow on trees. In some sense, you can just read them off of the way things are. Now, if you put it like that, then the problem is, this is walking right into the natural fallacy problem, the naturalistic fallacy problem. How do you read off the trees what's right and wrong for man? You don't. Now, if we could read off from people what's right and wrong for people, that would be fine. But you know, what are we reading? What are we looking at? That's the question. And uh, I hope, indeed, to give you, a, in a very general kind of outline, the right kind of uh, uh, basic answer to this question, too. So uh, you, uh, you won't be disappointed in that respect. Um, I want to add a couple of quick words about two very popular theories that are not of the same type. Now, the type we've been looking at so far are theories which are trying to account for the fundamental ideas of morals. What is it that makes morals tick at bottom? What morality all about? What, what makes it 
swing if it does. Um, the two theories I'm going to mention very briefly are sometimes pressed into service in this way and usually not. That is, they are theories that really require some other kind of answer of the type I've been looking for to the questions of, of morals. But I want to mention them anyway. One is egalitarianism, which is a very, very influential um, tendency in moral and political philosophy, especially, I guess I would say, uh, political. Egalitarianism, um, again, requires a distinction. And this is, again, extremely, extremely important because practically all the real egalitarians you know infer one from the other, and you can't do that, all right? So one of the senses of egalitarianism is that everybody is the same in the sense that we are all subjects of moral rules, that there are moral universals that are the same for everybody. It's true, I mean, I'm, I'm not disputing that. On the contrary, I'm, that's exactly one of the things I want to support. But the narrower and more usual view of egalitarianism is that we should all be, in some sense, given, uh, we should all get from each other the same amounts of something or other. And of course, in political economic context, it's almost always money. Egalitarians are people who think that somehow we should all be getting the same incomes and that there's something wrong with some people getting a lot more than other people. Um, now, for the moment, the main thing to point out about that is that doesn't follow from the other sense of egalitarianism in which it really just means universalism. It just doesn't follow from it. You need some proof, some argument in favor of any kind of substantial egalitarianism, which you can't get just from the thesis that there are the same rules for everybody. And what would those things be? Well, uh, I'm going to table that subject at this point for a moment simply because I'll get back to it a little bit later. And secondly, because it's a subject that could easily take you know, a whole course of lectures um, in itself. Um, finally, I'll mention a theory called utilitarianism. This is partly an act of, as it were, piety. Because back when I was young and, as I would say, foolish, uh, I thought utilitarianism was the right moral theory. Now, utilitarianism is the theory that what everybody ought always to do, always to do is to maximize the good, or more precisely, to maximize, sometimes let's say, uh, they use the word happiness, and that's all right, maximize happiness. Now, what makes utilitarianism special with a capital U is the view that we can somehow compare your happiness with yours, with yours, and indeed with everybody's, and that we can find some kind of common unit of happiness, the same for everybody. And the idea of utilitarianism is that one unit for Smith counts the same as one unit for Jones, no matter who Smith and Jones are. All right? Now, that's a, an intendedly more precise way of saying that uh, a, a, a given amount of utility counts morally the same, positively, in the case of positive utility, negatively in the case of negative utility, like pain, um, for everybody, in all contexts, everywhere. That's the basic uh, principle of morality, is that we should be maximizing the universal good. Now, the thing about that theory is, firstly, it sounds good. I mean, it, it's, got, it's got philosophical zing to it. The big problem is that it runs into very heavy weather very quickly when you start asking, well, for one thing, what it really means. Can we actually measure happiness and find out that doing one thing will produce five units for, for Jones and eight units for Smith? The closest thing we've got maybe to something like that is a dollar, right? Um, Canadian or American, or, <laughs> but anyway, um, there's a unit of currency might be treated this sort of that way, but as soon as you do treat it that way, I suspect most of you would think, gee, I don't know about that. 
And as a matter of fact, um, I want to give a, a, a little tiny illustrative a anecdote. It's, 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 it's not contrived at all because I'm sure that every one of you many times in your life has made exactly the same observation. So um, you've got $100 to, so to speak, spare, whatever spare means here. And you read the newspapers and you find out, you know, they're starving over in like Bangladesh or Central Africa or whatever. And then you read about this nice agency which, given your hundred dollars, is going to improve the health and lives of like, you know, two dozen people for a year or whatever. I mean, things are really cheap in those countries. Um, now you've got this nine-year-old boy and it's his birthday is coming up, and you were thinking of buying him, you know, some computer game or something like that. And what you know is the boy will be extremely interested in this game for at least 20 minutes. <laughs> Doesn't look like an awful lot of utility is being generated that way, whereas if you spend it, you know, for these grandiose projects of saving a whole bunch of lives in Africa, gee whiz, that looks like you know, you're going to be doing a heck of a lot of good with it. So what are you going to do with your hundred dollars? Now, I, I, I'll tell you the answer. In about ninety-nine point eight percent of cases, is spend it on your kid, right? <laughs> now that strongly suggests that, however attractive the language may be, and however good the theory sounds, it at least doesn't reflect what people are like. <laughs> I suspect that nobody actually believes what the utilitarian says, which is that. Uh, I ought to be devoting my resources, my activity, etc., to maximizing you know, universal happiness for all. Um, and whatever, however the chips may fall. Um, except, of course, in the case of my kid, or my husband, or my friends, or, and then the, you know, the list of exceptions is going to get pretty substantial. Well, you see what I mean. The difficulty with utilitarianism is that it sounds like it's, it sounds good, but it's somehow it's way off base relative to actual human interests and practices. And that kind of gets us back to our basic subject again. Why are all these theories wrong? <laughs> <laughs> to be quite blunt about it, why are they all? Why do they all fail? And I think the answer is well, look, what moral philosophy should be about is trying to show that it is rational for each of us to embrace the theory in question, whatever it is. We're trying to find some uh, principle, some rule, such that. Any rational person anywhere would, would buy into that rule rather than some other rule. Is there any rule of that kind? One popular view in moral philosophy is, no, there isn't. Uh, I, I want to have a word with those people, but the word is you know, about 25 years long, so we will, um, we will neglect that at the moment. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for something that rational people can all see the point of, they can all agree of, and what's more, and now this is the kicker, what's more is they have motiv the motivation to buy into this. There's something in it for, from their point of view. And that's hard. Now, um, a moment to talk about something called practical reason here. Now, philosophers for a long time, starting especially with one of my heroes, one of every philosopher's heroes, Aristotle, make a distinction between theoretical and practical reason. Theoretical reason, as I say, is about facts. It's physics and, and all those other sciences. That's theoretical reason, We're trying to figure out what's going on out there. Um, and of course, we use logic to get at it, but logic is common to everybody. And uh, again, uh, that raises large, lots of issues which we don't have time to go into here. Uh, I'm going to assume it for the nonce, but I think it's obviously true. Anyway, um, so that's, that's theoretical reason. Practical reason is dealing with goods and bads, rights and wrongs. It's making up your mind what to do. It's the, it's the reason of action. And the question before us is, what is practical reason anyway? What, what is its 
principle. The principle of theoretical reason is to find out how things are going out there. I mean, it's to describe the world correctly. It's to get at the truth about everything. Now, you might say, of course, practical reason is also about trying to get at the truth, but it's the truth of what we ought to do, and that's unfortunately looks pretty different from the truth about how things just actually are. And so the question is, uh, you know, like, how do we do that? Well, as usual, we look for basics here. And as it turns out, it's not so very difficult to find a basic here. Because each of us uh, is equipped with a bunch of things that we'll call briefly values or interests, desires, wants, you know. We, all of us, we each have a whole bunch of this sort of practical stuff kicking around in there. And when we make a decision, what do we do? Answer, well, we make some evaluations. We decide what's the most important thing among the various things that we want. How do I get it on this occasion? Well, I've got some powers, some abilities, capabilities that I can bring onto the scene. So uh, I have a, 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 a capacity for unilaterally controllable actions. Those are my actions. And then I have a bunch of interests. And what I do is I reason from uh, uh, on the basis of my information about my capabilities and my wants, I try to see how these feed maximally into those. Now notice I'm not assuming here egoism. That is, your interests don't have to be confined to yourself, and in most cases of us, they aren't. Um, on the other hand, hardly anybody's interests are literally universal in the way that utilitarianism says they are, as I pointed out, right? But whatever they are, Reason, practical reason, is practical because it consists in taking the information you've got about what you can do and how your actions would relate to the achievement of those um, uh, values and then going to it and, and doing it. Um, Aristotle had a wonderful um, example, which I think is, um, is a great way to illustrate the difference between practical and theoretical reason. Uh, Aristotle constructs a syllog what he calls a syllogism. Syllogism is a very stilted um, form of uh, reasoning. And the major premise, which you know, we're just accepting it for the sake of the example, dry food is good for you. I mean, it isn't that he believed that, but, but let's suppose, it, suppose that that's what you think. And here before me is dry food. Conclusion. Now, the conclusion could be rendered, well, so I should eat this food. But a better way to put the conclusion is chomp. <laughs> that is, it's the actual action that follows from these premises. That's what makes it a matter of practical reasoning. You go through a bunch of reasoning which ties together your interests or values on the one hand and your information about what you can do on the other. It puts them together in the best, in the, the way that, that you know, optimizes or maximizes your output, and then you do it. That's what makes you practically reasonable. Okay, question before us. So we've got all these people out here, like currently like seven billion or so, and we know a bunch of things about us. One is that we're all pretty different from each other. On the other hand, the other is that we're all creatures of practical reason in the sense that, you know, we're all of us, this, this um, template here is obviously applicable to everybody. When we ask, you know, why did he do what he did? We ask, well, what was he interested in? What does he want on the one hand? And secondly, what does he think he can do? And that's why he did it, right? Um, it works. Uh, question. Taking this minimal, very general, open-ended information about everybody and then addressing the question, okay, what about trying to, as I put it, buy into a set of marching orders that apply to all people everywhere. What do I do in order to get to that? There is actually a very, very good answer to that, formulated, again, by Plato, who kind of started everything, <laughs> um, which is called the social contract. Now, you may have heard about the social contract in a kind of political form. In its political form, the idea of the social contract was that somehow we all, whoever that is, well, all Canadians, for example, got together, ha ha, and, you know, ag and agreed to set up this government, and then thereafter we do what it says because we've agreed to it. Now, the trouble with the social contract theory as applied to politics in that way is that it's crap. 
<laughs> to put it briefly, that is, we didn't all get together. In fact, we couldn't all get together. And even if we did, the pro probability that we would all agree to set up the government we've got and the way it is is, is essentially zero, um, et cetera. Right? So I mean, politically, I think the social contract theory has you know, serious major problems. Um, that doesn't keep philosophers from working on it. And more, more, well, less power to them is what I say. <laughs> anyway, but... I want to move to a different version of it, called, which I call the moral, the social contract as applied to morality. Now that's quite a different matter. Um, and here I want to follow in the footsteps of the man who pretty well invented serious political philosophy, Thomas Hobbes. Now Hobbes tells us that uh, looking at the nature of man and then looking out at society, we've got a problem. And the problem is each one of us has got these very different desires and so forth. And here we are in uh, a condition in which nature, meaning independently of man, is not terribly helpful, not terribly kind to us. Uh, what we want, I mean, doesn't grow on trees. Or even if it does, there aren't enough trees and it's too high on the branches and goodness knows whatever. The point is uh, things are scarce. And because they're scarce, we've got competition problems. I mean, I know that you need to eat, and you know that I need to eat, and we know that there isn't enough for both of us, and what do we do? And Hobbes' answer is, well, what do you think we do? We fight. That's what we do. And indeed, he laid it down that in what he called the natural condition of mankind, we're all going to be at something that he called the universal war, the war of all against all. Now, let's translate this into moral terms. The universal war of all against all is going to be the complete, total absence of any moral rules. It means that nobody will have any moral inhibitions about doing anything. So whatever I think serves my interests, I do it. Whatever it does to you. And of course, I know that you're doing, you know, how to do the same thing about me. Now, a rational person contemplating this situation I think is going to quickly come and go, geez, it would be better if we had some rules around here, you know? <laughs> uh, maybe this condition of rulelessness isn't such a good idea. And indeed, it pretty obviously isn't. Now, about the word rule, moral rules, why do we use a word like rules? Or some people call it moral laws. That's OK. It's the, same, the idea is the same in both cases. What the idea is is, you take all this stuff that you've already got, your interests and your de desires and so forth, footnote, which by the way is the definitive answer to the naturalistic fallacy problem, as I'll explain in, in about three moments. <laughs> um, all right, you take those things. What do I need to add to them in order to optimize my relations to my fellow man? And Hobbes had, a, I think, a terrific, brilliant, and indeed, basically right answer to this. He said, well, the big problem is violence. And violence is getting what I want from you, not by asking you for it, but by just taking you for it, whether you like it or not, and in particular, where you don't. You probably don't, because after all, I'm taking from you something that you value, so it's not surprising if you don't want me to take it, but I just do it anyway. And since, of course, in the process, you might very well not like that very much, and we might come to blows, you can see the war of all, of it, uh, all against all looming before us. The war of all against all is, is um, as, as I'm describing it, is the absence of rules. Well, the absence of rules is very much like the presence of the minimal egoistic rules is everybody do whatever the hell you, you know, it pleases you to, to do. And Hobbes looks at this and says, well, that's the problem, you guys. What we need are some inhibitions. And which ones do we need? Now, the most promising answer to this, well, there, there, are, there are about, uh, David Hume has a wonderful discussion of this, by the way. It, it just is brilliant, um, and I, I should be able to, I can quote you from the chapter and verse, but I can't tell which chapter and verse it is, but it's in his in inquiry into the principles of morals. Um, anyway, um, so he says, well, one natural rule would be virtue. Let's, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's deal things out to the, to the most virtuous people. 
Hume correctly says this is, this is, this is not going to work, <laughs> to put it mildly, because people differ about what's virtuous, for one thing, and there's more to it than that. Or second, he said, well, you might think of deal, dealing them all equally and become an egalitarian. And he says, well, after, and after all, he says, and bringing in a kind of utilitarian element, he says, well, look, we know that um, um, to satisfy the wants of a princess might require an expenditure that would, would, would provide bread for her whole kingdom. Uh, surely uh, that's what we ought to do. But of course he knows and we know that that isn't what people are going to do because it's not what they want to do. It's not what it would be rational for them to do. And finally, what is there? Well, now there is something because what there is is, well, wait a minute, all of us, whoever we are, we can take our situations as they stand, and those tell us which way is down and which way is up, which way is forward and which way is back. And what we have, all of us, in common is we don't want to be moved back, especially not by somebody else, right? I mean, I may make mistakes, okay, but they're my mistakes, damn it. And if I want you to help, fine, I can ask. But if I don't ask, and you just take matters into your own. That's what I don't want. What I don't want is to be, in the words of one philosopher, subjugated by you. So what we want is we, we all uh, universally, our desire is in our actions with other people, we don't want the interaction to come out worse for us. And if you think about war, well, it's worse for both parties. I mean, war is a great way of bringing about all the miseries and awfulnesses that we all know are, are liable to that state. Um, to will universal law is, I mean, we're, universal war is completely insane. Willing universal peace, and peace, on the other hand, makes very good sense. And willing universal peace has the following important, important virtue, and it's the one that most political extremists, and indeed non-extremists, overlook. And that is, we all have a natural motivation of this kind. We would also like it if other people would do good for us. Hooray! We might put it this way. What each of us wants from each of the other one is um, a treatment which maximizes the good as I see it, which does the best for me overall. That's right. That's what I would like. But how about what you would like? Would you like to do that? I don't think so, as we've seen <laughs> in the case of the mom with $100 to spend and ends up spending it on her kid's birthday. Uh, she's got other ideas about what to do with it. And if I insist on his doing good to me as opposed to just not doing harm to me, I've got a problem. Namely, he doesn't have the motivation to do that. Now, of course, he doesn't have the direct motivation to avoid harm to me either, but there's a wonderful indirect motivation, which is if he does, I'm going to hit him if I can. And if I know I can't, I'm going to go to my friends and say, here, you're going to help me hit this guy because we can't let him, you know, I don't want to let him do that, etc. And, you know, we're going to have this war, and the war is going to be awful for everybody. So now, a thing that that would make a rule for everybody practically rational is one which had the happy consequence of being better for literally everybody than the absence of rules altogether, and that's practically a no-brainer, or than any other rule. And I think that that's the non-harm rule, otherwise known as the libertarian rule. Now, there are several different formulations of it. I think they all come to the same thing, sometimes called the non-aggression principle. And those are, are all rules of the, in the right direction. Notice that it's not pacifism. Pacifism is the view that uh, harming people is wrong absolutely no matter what and independent of anything else. Well, the trouble is if they're trying to kill you, does that mean I don't get to stop them? Yes, it does. I don't think I want that. <laughs> pacifism doesn't sound like the right idea there. No, what we want is everybody refrains from doing harm to everybody else and we confine our ability to harm people to just defense. That is, people who are trying to harm us for the bad reasons, well, they, we get to use, um, use that kind of tactics on. But everybody else, 
um, we, the rule is peace. Now notice that there are two possibilities here in relating A and B, supposing that we accept this rule. Either you and I do nothing to each other, in which case we're the same way we were before, so nobody has harmed anybody. Or we have a relation which is beneficial to both of us. Now, there are different ways of doing that, but the main, overwhelmingly main way in the world for the last mm, roughly 9,000 years or so is we, so to say, ask each other what we want, and we notice that he can give me something I want, and I can give him something that he wants, and we make a deal, right? Agreeable to both parties. Now, that's free trade. And the big benefit of free trade is it benefits both parties. So they both have a motivation to engage in it. They also both have a motivation to cheat. And that, of course, won't do. And our general fundamental principle says cheating is wrong. Indeed, the rule consists in saying be peaceable. And cheating is one way of not being peaceable. Um, there are various other specific ways of doing it. But it's enough to, to see that the way of going forward is by agreement. And the way of going forward from the state of nature in which there are no rules is by lack of disagreement, as it were. Not specific agreements, but the general um, agreement that we are not going to use violent methods in relation to each other. Once we've got that in place, then we're all ready for making uh, mutually agreeable exchanges. And of course, mutually exchangeable, uh, agreeable exchanges leads us to, to the capitalism, of which I am a big fan. And I'm not just a big fan because practically everybody else in academia today isn't. That's a fairly good reason for being against something, but it's not definitive. It's just that capitalism is such an obviously desirable thing that unless you are um, misled by one of these very bad arguments I've been telling you about, uh, it is obviously the way to go because capitalism simply consists in letting people use their resources as they want to so long as they use them in ways that are agreeable to everybody else. So look, for example, at the uh, extremely wealthy who are the objects of much hatred of, by practically all academics today. Um, so look, I suppose you've got a whole lot of money. How do you get it? Firstly, you got it by making a whole bunch of stuff for a whole lot of people, because you can't make a whole lot of money if you don't do this. If you're a billionaire, there must have been a heck of a lot of people out there who bought your merchandise, because a billion is a lot of money, right? And all those people have been done some good to. Look at Microsoft or um, Apple or all those big companies. Well, and then look at the millions and millions of people who have benefited from having computers or in the case of oil, from having cars that they can drive around conveniently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so firstly, the way you make your money if you're rich is by, is by doing a heck of a lot of good for a heck of a lot of people. Now secondly, consider the money that you make, the profit. What do you do with that? Well, uh, most rich people invest almost all of their money, not surprisingly, and that of course creates new jobs and having, having people produce more stuff than more people want, and that's all to the good. And finally, they might spend it on luxury items. Now, I love expenditures on luxury items, unlike my fellow philosophers. Why? Well, firstly, I mean, they're cute. People build wonderful big houses. I like to look at them, very nice. They buy, you know, beautiful clothing. That's fine, I like to look at them. They don't like to look at me, but you know, <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, you know it's all fair game here. But you know, today's people are, you walk around the streets in Vancouver and you see all these nice looking people. It's great. And it's, why are they nice? Because they can afford to be nice looking. They can afford to buy that kind of clothing. They can afford to go to people who you know, keep their facial appearances, etc. And that's wonderful. That's all, that's all a, a, a good thing. And of course, there are Ferraris dear to my heart, uh, things like that. And we wouldn't have those if we didn't have rich people. And the thing about Ferraris is the people who make Ferraris they have really, really good jobs, right? I mean, if you ever worked in an automobile plant and you moved to the Ferrari plant, you would think you were in heaven. 
it's a great place to work. <laughs> and it, it, it offers a wonderful um, um, outlet for creativity. Um, it takes all kinds of ingenious ideas to make something as complex and as interesting as a Ferrari. And then there's all those great pictures in museums, and there's the opera and the symphony and all those good things. You can't have that if you don't have wealth. If you don't have immoderate wealth, you're not likely to have all that stuff. And those are all good things. So what the heck? Why, people, why are people complaining about it? Well, probably because they think that the poor are, are downtrodden by the rich. They're downtrodden, all right, but not by the rich. They're downtrodden by their governments, <laughs> some of whom, of course, are rich people. But generally speaking, um, as Professor Plymer's speech pointed out, um, governments do all sorts of things to make life miserable for the poor. Eliminating that would be the number one way to eliminate poverty around the world. Of course, it, poverty has already been eliminated in North America anyway. I mean, it, um, as Chris Sarlo says, you look at Canada, we don't exactly, we don't really have poor people by world standards. You go to India for five minutes and then you come back here and say, where are these supposed poor people? Anyway, but um, the point is, uh, <coughs> It's not the case that the way you make people less poor is to get out the law and bludgeon the rich into helping them out. This is a dumb way to do it. The smart way to do it is, A, people who are sympathetic to the poor, such as the people who write all these articles about how awful rich people are. All right, let's, what are you doing for the poor, buddy? And the answer is almost always nothing. <clears throat> Whereas you look at the rich, like Bill Gates, whose foundation for curing curable diseases in Africa is now up to something like $40 billion capitalization. That's a heck of a lot of good that that man's doing to an awful lot of people in the world. Where are you, socialist writer, in this thing? Anyway, hmm? answer, just you know, pushing your stupid theories about the way society should be run. The, the, the fallacies of which I have, by the way, exposed in some articles. So um, all things put together, my point is, as a morality, you really can't do better than the libertarian morality, and that's why it's rational for everybody to embrace it. By the way, I've left a selection, a small number of my books on the table. I think want to look at it, and that, that's my concluding commercial for the day. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you, you can stay there, actually. We can do two things at the same time. Those people who want to have a coffee, they can go out. And those people who want to ha who have questions can ask Dr. Navison questions in the meantime. I, I would but ask people we, to... we, we, Please be back by 11 o'clock. Yeah. 10 minutes, actually. Sorry about this, but only 10 minutes. OK. So you can stay there. I would ask people who ask questions to speak very clearly, because my hearing is, unfortunately, quite bad. Sure, absolutely. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, in the question of morality, I'm, I'm always, I've uh, been curious about the nature. Can you hear me okay? Just. Just? How's that? Okay. The nature of the question of a moral, the nature of a moral question, it's truth uh, content. That is to say, whether it's objective or not. Now, I notice that sometimes there's a theme of the moral question is hypothetical. That is to say, if you value a certain outcome, if you value a certain outcome, then you should, you ought to act in a certain way. If you're a libertarian and you have libertarian values, you should act in a way consistent with that. I want to qualify that. Okay. Uh, that's prudential reasoning speaking, that's ethics. It's not morality yet. Morality doesn't say if you desire something then, then that's what you ought to do. It says if you desire something that's probably what you're going to do but well but when you start doing it you better check out and see what it's what happens if to other people in the process of your doing it. And if something bad is going to happen to them then you don't, you pull back. But don't you think that um, being concerned about what's bad to somebody else is also a matter of a value? That is, if I don't care, or let's say I like tyranny, I approve of it, I want to implement some, that's my value, and therefore my morality is, your morality doesn't apply to me. You're, you're just in favor of war. Exactly. And if, and if we know that, well, we'll do our best to kill you. 
Okay. So. Okay. So my question I'm is that. War. I'm against, I'm against war against so my question is, do we agree then? Like, and it's not my proposition. I just want to be. I want to see how 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 you see it. That moral moral questions and morality ultimately are not a matter of objective truth, but are rather hypothetical. That is, it really does depend on where you're coming no, from. No, that's all wrong. No. Of course they're matters of objective truth. That is to say, it's an objective truth that people have subjective values. That's an objective truth. It's not, it's not a, and there isn't anything dubious about this. It's an objective people truth. People have various e things. E have various things. That's a fact. Yes. It's an, the it's, question is, where do we go from there? Right. It's an objective truth that some people prefer chocolate and others prefer vanilla. But we all acknowledge that there's no, uh, there's no objective truth about which is better chocolate or vanilla, right? That's, that's, that's the evaluative side of this, yeah. Exactly. So, I will... By, by the way, we don't, the point is we don't address ourselves to that. Look, I think like Mahler's um, Fifth Symphony is objectively better than San Martini's Fourth. Now, that's a, certainly, of course, an opinion on my part. I am prepared to back it up. I know something about music. And almost anybody who listened to it would agree with me about this, and we would, you know, look at it. So I'm not claiming that there aren't any objective values. I am claiming, however, that different people will have different, embrace different ones, and, and it is not surprising if their actions and consequence are different. That's why some people go to the symphony like I do, and other people don't. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, when I met you in Edmonton, uh, I asked you if you were uh, in favor of the concept of democracy as it relates to governing oh, of... I, I can't hear that. Could you... Oh, okay. I, I asked you if the uh, concept, if you believed in the concept of democracy as it relates to uh, governments at the provincial, state, and federal level. And you, I thought you said you did agree with that. Do you still have that view that you agree that democracy is a, val a morally valid concept? Well, I've written a lot of papers about democracy. Democracy is a, is a big problem. And it's a big problem for an obvious reason. Because democracy says, rule by the greater numbers. The guy who gets the most votes wins. Now, what these are votes for is wielding political power, which is a very, very dangerous thing. Political power is basically bad because it basically consists in not letting people do what they want. So what we want, and if, if, if we, the question is how can we control political power in the best way? Now, people who claim to be enthusiasts for democracy that I know of, almost all actually smuggle in a lot of other things besides voting. Voting is the essence of democracy. Mm. The people shall rule. How do they rule? They have an election. Mm. Uh, but, maybe yeah, I'd just we, like to interrupt in you here. For democracy to be any damn good, we have to have restrictions against personal violence. Yeah. We have to have restrictions against, um, I mean, all kinds of democratic restrictions. People, nobody yeah. gets to. Rule I, I want to interrupt you for a second because yeah. it's much, much simpler than that. All you require is voluntary consent. To make the dem all you require is voluntary consent. In order to make a democracy valid, you require voluntary consent. And we don't have voluntary consent, so therefore democracy is not morally valid. And so it's, it's really quite simple, and to jazz it up with all these other things is kind of irrelevant in my view. And just, and if you disagree, just you can let me know, but. Walter Block teaches there's two kinds of human interaction. There's a voluntary, peaceful, uh, vo uh, voluntary consent transactions, which is the libertarian way, and then there's the barbaric way of everybody else, the, of totalitarian societies and even dictatorships uh, or democracies. Uh, in democracies, we had slavery, we had sterilization of adults, we had uh, Japanese internment camps, German inter internment camps, we had the First Nation people, we had all kinds of horrible things 
happen because of democracy, yeah, which war. and war, yeah. But they're all and even Hitler was democratically elected. Yeah, it so like this is getting to be a very large question, and I don't think I can. No, it's all very simple. Is if you have the right to opt out, then by remaining you have voluntary consent. But like the black slaves in 1860 America, they did not have the right to opt out. They had they were forced to stay there through violence, and they could get murdered or uh, slashed to death. So there was no voluntary consent. But that was consistent with democracy. It wasn't consistent with liberty. So uh, the way I see it, it's very simple. It all boils down to voluntary consent. If you want to have a democratic body, you have to voluntarily consent to the power that that uh, democratic institution has. Anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, things get very complicated. I, I don't think it's complicated at all. Well, I just, it's, it, it, I don't understand why you can't. Like, it wouldn't be if it were easy to trace the consequences of general consent. But actually it's very difficult, especially because of public goods problems, which economists are rightly concerned about. Um, so it isn't, it isn't easy to give a sort of short answer to this. Basically, of course, I'm, I'm on your side. I mean, we all yeah. want, we all want, um, our ideal is that all relations among persons would be voluntary and agreeable. agreeable. Yeah. That, that's our ideal. But how that exactly uh, um, works out in, the, in a political sphere is very hard to say. Yeah. Uh, ideally, of course, there would be no political sphere. I mean, we would all be anarchists like I am. But, I mean, anarchism yeah. is not a very practical attitude towards specific issues of the day. So. Yeah, even that I, I disagree with because you, you have to start off with zero government, but then through voluntary consent, you can have whatever form of government you choose. Like a, a Hutterite colony, for example, yeah. is almost pure socialism, but what makes it morally valid is the fact that you can opt out anytime you want. So you're, you're there through voluntary consent. I, if I'm you don't sorry, like I'm, the... I'm having extreme difficulty hearing yeah. this. Um, anyway. Uh, let, me, let me go and talk with you sort of at close up, and then maybe we can...